I first started competing in Melee in 2005. Years of hard work eventually made me one of the best players in the world, however, just like many other Melee players, my career was sidelined by hand and wrist issues. By 2015, I was retired, but determined to find a way back. In late 2016, hope came in the form of digital controllers entering the fray within the Smash community. I was quick to try out early models of these controllers as a potential solution to my problems, but I was just as quick to find out what I'd gotten myself into. Converting Melee to digital inputs came with all sorts of implications which ranged from game balance to intuitive design. All of this was uncharted territory, and many people doubted that creating a functional digital controller was even possible. Because I had nothing to lose, I sought out to get my career back by designing a controller called The Box. Most of the work I did on The Box took place in 2017 and 2018, but plenty of finishing touches were given in more recent years. The discoveries I made along the way caused me to gain a deeper understanding of the game and contribute to other projects as well, such as fixes for GameCube controllers. Most importantly, the box would end up saving thousands of Melee players' careers. This video will cover the full extent of the work I did to design an ergonomic controller that would change the game forever. Before I begin, I want to give a much-deserved shout-out to Kyle Simple McDowell, who produces and codes the box from his home in Hawaii. This project would not be possible without his hard work. The first three months of the box's development were dedicated to its button layout. A good amount of the box's button layout was straightforward, but there were some tough decisions to make. The up button's location in particular tends to stand out to most box users, so I'll explain how it ended up here. I ruled out a WASD layout early on due to the fact that it makes up very difficult to reach. From there, the left thumb would normally be an option, but the box needs this area for some other buttons that I'll get to in a moment. The right pinky finger is the only eligible location for up at that point. Fortunately, this location works extremely well for the up button, despite the fact that it's never been done before. Next up are modifiers X and Y, which are assigned to the left thumb. These buttons can be used to influence the box's analog stick inputs. The priority here was keeping the number of modifiers to a minimum of two in order to maximize the box's performance. The steps that were taken to achieve this were very complicated, and will be covered in future chapters of this video. Finally, the last difficult decision I had to make was giving light shield and medium light shield their own dedicated buttons. The first version of the box actually didn't have these buttons. Less than 500 units of this version were made before I realized that dedicated buttons were the best way to integrate light shielding, and so that change was made on box revision 2. The next subject to go over is the box's analog stick nerfs. I'm going over this subject early on because it's important to rule out the coordinates that wouldn't be fair for the box to pinpoint with 100% accuracy. Melee has over 8,000 coordinates in total, but many of them aren't realistic to pinpoint consistently with an analog stick, and so the box shouldn't be able to either. The first coordinate range that's banned on the box is called Y-tilt plus greater than 50 degrees. As you can see, banning this range removes a large chunk of the coordinate plane. Y-tilt plus greater than 50 degrees is the range that can be used to perform unbuffer turnaround up tilts and down tilts. It can also be used to ledge fall without fast falling while having the analog stick pointed forward, which is ideal for ledge dashing. While these are all useful techniques, this coordinate range is difficult to pinpoint on a GameCube controller due to the fact that it isn't along the rim, and so it's completely removed from the box. The second coordinate range that's banned on the box is Y-tilt plus vertical B. This is the range that lets you up B without tap jumping and shine without falling through a platform. Y-tilt plus vertical B is yet another useful range, but it isn't accessible on a GameCube controller because of how thin it is. The third coordinate range that's banned is Shield Drop Down, which is directly below Y-tilt plus vertical B in quadrants 3 and 4. Shield Drop Down is a thin line that lets you shield drop without shutting off roll. This range needs to be banned because the Melee community has chosen to standardize the notch shield drop method, which requires you to shut off roll first. The fourth coordinate range that's banned is short hop tap jump, which is a single Y value right above the dead zone. If you shift your analog stick's coordinates to this Y value during jump squat, then your character will short hop. Believe it or not, only a single Y value in the game lets you do this. The fifth coordinate range that's banned is Jigglypuff, Kirby, and Yoshi's backwards double jump without turning around. This can be performed by pointing in the two X values right next to the dead zone. While this technique is useful, it's unrealistic to perform with a GameCube controller. The sixth coordinate range that's banned is Pikachu and Pichu's double upwards up B. This is a useful technique for recovering from the bottom blast zone, but the coordinates that enable it are almost impossible to pinpoint. The seventh range that's banned is middle angled F tilt and F smash. Believe it or not, there were originally plans to include five F tilt and F smash directions in Melee. However, the fourth and fifth directions were scrapped at the last minute. Only a single coordinate in each quadrant lets you access these directions on the public game disc. Finally, the eighth range that's banned is Ice Climber's desyncs. These desyncs are scattered across the analog stick and can be found at all the thresholds where certain techniques can be performed. Nana's analog stick values are sometimes one off of Popo's, and so the Ice Climbers will be on two different sides of these thresholds whenever you point at the perfect coordinates. 
This allows for a variety of techniques such as solo smash attacks, tap jumps, etc. When the eight ranges I just listed are overlapped, it'll look like so. As you can see, a large amount of the coordinate plane is illegal for the box to pinpoint. Additionally, there's a ninth nerf called Accidental Side B, which conditionally bans the range that can be used to perform a turnaround neutral B without risking an Accidental Side B. This nerf is implemented by making it so that if the B button is pressed while you're in this range, the coordinates are pushed out as to cause a side B. There's a single instance of this nerf existing on the box that I'll eventually cover. The effect this nerf has is that it forces you to flick your horizontal input in order to perform a turnaround neutral B, as failing to do so will result in an accidental side B. This replicates the risk you'd run on a GameCube controller. There are air dodge and up B angle nerfs on the box as well. Both of these mechanics are balanced around a notchless GameCube controller, as not all players have notches, and so I didn't want the box to create problems. As for the exact values that are used for these techniques, I'll get to them when the time comes. Lastly, there are a few impossible input sequences that are banned on the box. The first one is double quarter circle SDI. The box is programmed to recognize when a quarter circle SDI sequence has been performed, and from there it bans the direction you'd want to go to next for a couple of frames as to keep its SDI capabilities reasonable. The other input sequence that's banned is pivot tilts. All the pivot tilts except for forward tilt have timing lockouts as well that ensure they're in line with what's reasonable. Now that all the box's restrictions have been laid out, we can move on to its functionality. The box's analog stick points at the eight coordinates you'd expect on its own. These are 1.0 cardinals and 0.7.7 diagonals. However, modifier buttons are where things get interesting. Modifiers X and Y act as shift keys which don't do anything on their own, but modify the analog stick's coordinates when held in conjunction with directional keys. I'll start by going over modifier X. As we've established, plenty of the analog stick's coordinates can't be used for various reasons, but luckily melee can be played just fine without them. Modifier X's basic functionality is modifying each of the four cardinal directions, as well as the four quadrants so that you can perform tilt attacks. The value of 0.6625 is used along the x-axis. This value suffices for tilts while also allowing you to slight DI two-thirds of the way along the analog stick when you're thrown vertically. Next, the value of 0.5375 is used along the y-axis. This value is chosen because it's the final tilt value along the y-axis that can be used before the y-tilt plus vertical B nerf prohibits the rest of them. This value is mainly used for performing up tilt and down tilt. Then the quadrants use 0.7375 along the x-axis with 0.3125 along the y-axis. These values may seem random, so I'll explain them. Melee's tilt range runs up until 0.7875. However, the final four values within the tilt range are different because they break teeter. If you walk with 0.7875 as your x value, for example, it'll be possible to accidentally SD by falling off the stage. 0.7375 is the furthest you can extend the x-axis while retaining the ability to teeter, which is why the box uses this value. Finally, the y value I listed is chosen because two of the nerfs I showed you earlier prohibit some of the values that hug the dead zones most closely. Although only one y value is banned for this reason, I skipped the one that comes after for the sake of having symmetry with modifier y, which I'll be going over in a moment. Modifier x's quadrant coordinates can be used to perform angled f tilts without risking falling off the stage. Another thing to know about these coordinates is that they form a 23 degree angle, which is the shallowest angle on the box. This lets you Firefox as shallowly as the box permits. The box's best Firefox angles are nerfed by 6.2 degrees, which is fair in relation to GameCube controllers that don't have notches. Next up is Modifier Y. Modifier Y uses quadrant coordinates that mirror Modifier X's in order to produce a 67 degree Firefox angle. Modifier Y's quadrant coordinates can also be used to perform buffer turnaround up tilts. This lets you turn around up till more easily from certain states. Modifier Y's vertical cardinals then use the same Y value as its quadrants for the sake of staying in line. Finally, Modifier Y's horizontals use the X value of 0.3375. This value completes the box's slight DI by allowing you to DI a third of the way across the analog stick. One last thing about Modifier Y is that it features the accidental side B nerf I mentioned earlier. 0.3375 along the X axis would normally allow you to guarantee a turnaround neutral B which is why this coordinate gets pushed outward when you press the B button. The next aspect of the box to go over are its non-dedicated modifiers. Non-dedicated modifiers are a necessary feature because they allow the box to operate with only two dedicated modifier buttons. Minimizing the number of modifier buttons on the box was a high priority of mine, which led to me realizing that other buttons needed to serve as modifiers in order for this to work. The box's B, L, R, and C stick buttons all serve as non-dedicated modifiers in specific situations. I just went over the box's accidental side B nerf, which occurs when B is pressed in conjunction with modifier Y's horizontal value. This is an example of a non-dedicated modifier being used to enforce a nerf, which is one of the main reasons that they're needed. 
The other instance of non-dedicated modifiers being used to enforce a nerf has to do with the L and R buttons. When these buttons are pressed in conjunction with modifier X or Y's quadrants, their angles will be modified to 30.5 degrees and 59.5 degrees respectively. The reasoning for each of these angles is very extensive, so I'll explain them in full. For starters, air dodges deserve to have their angles nerfed due to the fact that they require you to aim very quickly. When you perform a Firefox, for example, you have 42 frames to aim, whereas wave dashing gives you only a handful. This makes it much more difficult to wave dash at a good angle, and so the box's angling capabilities are more genuine if air dodges are made worse than up B. As for why these exact angles are chosen, it's very complicated. In my search for non-arbitrary air dodge coordinates, I realized that ledge dashing is an area of the game that requires you to air dodge from the same position repeatedly. This meant that ledge dashing would have thresholds which I could use to decide on the appropriate air dodge values. Surely enough, I would end up finding relevant thresholds for each character. Sheik is the first character who would end up having a threshold that influenced my design decisions. When Sheik ledge dashes with her typical ECB, she wants to double jump on frame 2 and air dodge on frame 9. From there, the amount of galant Sheik receives is dependent on her air dodge angle. Steeper angles are beneficial because they allow Sheik to ground earlier and receive more galant. The box accommodates Sheik's highest galant ledge dash by producing a 59.5 degree air dodge angle when L or R is pressed in conjunction with mod Y. This is the final set of coordinates within her max galant range. 59.5 degrees also doubles as a well-rounded short wave dash for all characters to use. As for modifier X's air dodge angle, Fox's ledge dash was the determining factor. When Fox ledge dashes with his typical ECB, 30.5 degrees or shallower is an important air dodge threshold for him. This threshold is relevant when Fox ledge falls without fast falling for two frames, double jumps with 1.0 trajectory on frame 3, and then air dodges on frame 6. Fox's air dodge has to be 30.5 degrees or shallower at that point in order to make it on stage. 30.5 degrees also mirrors the angle that's used for Sheik, which is a nice little perk. However, you might have noticed that unlike the coordinates used for Mod Y's air dodge, Mod X's air dodge coordinates aren't along the rim. This is intentionally done because there exists a single set of coordinates in the game that uses the same angle as the one along the rim while having lower magnitude. The lower magnitude set of coordinates is better to use for Modifier X because of the teeter threshold I mentioned earlier. By using this set of coordinates, Modifier X's air dodge stays on the same side of the teeter threshold as its default coordinates. This is more genuine because pressing L or R shouldn't cause you to cross the teeter threshold, which would happen if the higher magnitude set of coordinates was used. The same teeter threshold applies during wave dashes, for anyone wondering. Another fun fact is that Modifier Y's air dodge angle has to use the higher magnitude set of coordinates because of the Y tilt plus vertical B nerf. This nerf blocks the lower magnitude 59.5 degree angle, and so Modifier Y is forced to use the coordinates along the rim. The next chapter of this video will be a quick intermission from non-dedicated modifiers. This chapter will go over two rules the box's directional keys follow. These rules heavily influence ledge dashing, which is why I waited until now to introduce them. The first rule the box's directional keys follow is called override. Override states that when a cardinal value is input, it will take precedence over the opposite cardinal that was formerly held. Override is mostly relevant for dash dancing, as it's important that newly input dashes don't conflict with previous ones. However, override is also very important for ledge dashing, as it lets you ledge fall by pressing back, then override back with forward so that you can jump toward the stage. There's another rule that comes into play at this point. This one is called the double horizontal rule. As I just explained, you'll want to override back with forward when ledge dashing so that you can jump toward the stage. However, the modifier buttons would normally conflict with this input sequence by stunting your jump trajectory. Modifier X, for example, would reduce your jump trajectory to 0.6625, which is worse than the ideal value of 1.0. This is where the double horizontal rule comes into play. The double horizontal rule states that if both horizontal cardinal directions are held, the modifier buttons won't influence the analog stick's inputs. This allows you to ledge fall with back, then override back with a forward value of 1.0, even if you're holding a modifier button. The double horizontal rule is essential because it makes it so that you're never battling against the controller. In Fox's case, this is huge for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Fox needs to be able to jump toward the stage with the best possible trajectory in order for a 30.5 degree ledge dash to succeed, and so it's crucial that Modifier X doesn't stunt him. Next I'll be explaining how to tilt your shield on the box. As I explained in the past two chapters, Modifier X uses a 30.5 degree air dodge angle so that Fox's ledge dash can meet a threshold it needs. From there, the lower magnitude coordinates are used because they're on the same side of the teeter threshold. This is only half the reason the lower magnitude coordinates are used, however. The other reason these coordinates are used is because they stay within the shield tilt range, as can be seen in this diagram. All four of Mod X's cardinal directions are within the shield tilt range as well, and so by keeping its quadrants within this range, Mod X becomes a fully equipped shield tilt button. This is an example of how I optimize the box by choosing the most efficient coordinates. 
Mod X is able to serve as an all-purpose button, which lets you shield tilt, wave dash at your best angle, and perform tilt attacks. Packing this much functionality into a single modifier button is partly how I kept the total number of them to two. The other way I did this was through the use of non-dedicated modifiers. Going back to non-dedicated modifiers, there are still a few more to go over. The remaining non-dedicated modifiers allow you to Firefox at several more angles, as modifiers X and Y's angles aren't enough on their own. The C-Stick buttons come into play here by letting you choose from 4 additional angles per modifier button, which means 11 angles per quadrant if you factor in 45 degrees. Something to note is that the C-Stick angles were chosen by banning all the coordinates that were listed earlier on in the video, and then finding the best distribution from there. This lets Fox and Falco enjoy a well-rounded selection of angles which fulfills their recovery needs. As for the characters other than Fox and Falco who can angle their up B, more functionality is necessary. This is because characters like Sheik have the magnitude of their analog stick input factored into their up B, and so the angles I've shown you thus far don't suffice. The final non-dedicated modifier on the box is the B button, which can be used to extend the magnitude of the box's up B angles. By holding B in conjunction with the C stick angles I just showed you, they'll be pushed outward toward the rim. This completes Sheik, Zelda, Pikachu, Pichu, and Mewtwo's up B functionality. The next feature on the box is angled F smash, which requires its own unique set of inputs. This is because the functionality I've shown you thus far doesn't offer a way to access the angled F smash range other than through the use of some of the extended up B angles. It wouldn't be reasonable to make people use these for angled F smash as they require the B and C stick buttons to be held, which is why angled F smash works differently. Angled F smash is performed on the box by holding modifier X in conjunction with up or down, then pressing C stick left or right. This works because mod X plus up or down produces neither a tap jump nor a crouch, and so these inputs are strictly used to designate which direction you want. Then your horizontal C-stick input will produce a diagonal input. I decided it was fine for a single C-stick button to produce a diagonal input in this scenario because angled F-smash is a special case that needs to be accommodated. That brings me to the next aspect of the box, which is its C-stick functionality. Unlike the analog stick, the box's C-stick doesn't point in the eight directions you'd expect. To be exact, the C-stick's quadrants point at a steeper angle that's halfway between the 45 degree corners and cardinals. These C-stick values are used because of a hidden technique called diagonal ASDI down, which is needed to perform slide-offs in certain scenarios. Diagonal ASDI down is needed because certain frames of tech roll and get-up roll aren't actually atop the platform, but rather slightly to the side of it. ASDI straight down won't suffice for a slide-off if you're hit on these frames. Instead, you'll need to ASDI diagonally down, hence the box's C-stick coordinates. In case you're wondering why these coordinates need to be steeper than 45 degrees, it's because a large Y value is needed in order for your ASDI down to be able to hug the floor and so halfway down from 45 degrees is appropriate. One last feature for us to go over is the box's light shield functionality. Light shield can be accessed through the two dedicated light shield buttons at the top right of the box. As for exactly which light shield values are used, I'll explain how this works. Light shield's analog range spans from 43 to 140 on a software level. Contrary to popular belief, the Z button's light shield is not equal to the lightest value of 43, but rather the value of 49. The box's dedicated light shield button uses the value of 49 as to remain in line with Z. Then the value of 94 is used for medium light shield. This value is halfway between 49 and 140. I should mention that it's important for 140 as well as any values close to it to be banned due to their ability to generate a shield that's equal or slightly smaller than a digital shield without inputting a tech, air dodge, or power shield. This enables all sorts of exploits that are unreasonable to perform with a GameCube controller, which is why the box doesn't contain these light shield values. Finally, the box needs to be able to access the D-pad in order to perform taunts and other obscure commands. This is done by holding both modifier buttons at once. The four C-stick directions will then turn into the D-pad. If you made it this far into the video, first and foremost, thank you for supporting the box. Because today's Christmas Day, Simple and I will be providing the first update to the box in over a year. The box's software was last updated to version 3 on September 27, 2020, but as of today, it's been updated to version 3.1. Version 3.1 features a niche option called the Crouch Walk Option Select, which several players have requested recently. The Crouch Walk Option Select is performed by crouching with the values that let you remain in crouch, but won't initiate a crouch if you aren't already in one. What this lets you do is option select a walk that counteracts your horizontal knockback after you're hit from crouch. The Crouch Walk Option Select is a useful technique, however, the box software that I've shown you thus far can't perform it due to the fact that its quadrant 3 and 4 coordinates will initiate a crouch. What's interesting is that these coordinates have merit as well because they let you perform a jab cancel, which is when you cancel a jab's ISA frames with a diagonal crouch that lets you jab again by pressing A. Because neither jab cancel nor the crouch walk option select is strictly better than the other, box version 3.1 features a toggle that lets you choose between them by holding the down button as you plug in your box. Your settings will then be stored until you manually change them again. 
This will let Box users enjoy the setting that suits their playstyle best. Although the work I showed you in this video may have been straightforward enough, the Box took thousands of hours to complete. This controller was conceived during a time period when very little was known about Melee, and so I had to research the game extensively in order to make it a reality. Plenty of updates were given to the box along the way, and finding the means to produce it was a journey in itself. The end result was worth it though, as the box has not only given me my career back, but also helped thousands of other Melee players in the process. It's become an iconic product which has had a life-changing effect on many people, and it remains my biggest contribution to the Melee community. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to retweet it on Twitter for a chance to win a free box. You can also learn more about the box by visiting Box.com. Box.com is also home to the 1.03 memory card, which is a game-changing device that patches Melee in all the ways its community needs. 1.03 memory cards can either be purchased on their own or as a set, as they're now being included with all box orders.